Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. All right, cool. So uh, today we will uh, continue on uh, from DRAM and how DRAM works into how does multiple processor works together and how to make sure that they work well. Uh, so why do we want multiprocessor, right? Um, this kind of date back uh, in the day where you have like Intel Pentium, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, and Pentium 4, AMD has the same line of like their CPU, right? The problem with those CPU is if you look at the performance you gain, which is typically measured in the clock frequency as well as the improve in the microarchitecture in a single core processor, right? Over the power that the processor consumes. What it turns out is these processes are getting, it drains more and more of the power to the point that it's getting too high, right? So if you look at the peak power of these, like say Pentium 4 processor, you, you might have noticed that the, the power consumption of these processors is really, really high. And at some point, the architect saw that these cannot go on forever, right? You can't just make the uh, processor faster because in reality, the power consumption go exponentially bigger, right? As you scale the clock cycle. So if you are going to have like say a 10 gigahertz processor, you would need to consume a lot of power. And at some point, if you plot this trajectory, right? You don't want to have a nuclear power plant powering the supercomputer that you might have uh, used in a, in a, in a large super com computing center. So the solution is, okay, instead of relying on one single really, really high performance core, right? We would add more processing core instead, where each core would share the same resources in the hierarchy. Like let's say I can have four uh, processor with a private L1, right? The level of cache is private to each of the processor. The share L2 is shared amongst all the four processors and you have to share memory. So <clears throat> with this, right, how can I utilize this multiprocessor? Because each processor is now weaker in some sense, right? Because you need to dedicate an area for each processor. You might have smaller instruction windows compared to a large core. You might have lower clock frequency compared to the large core, et cetera, et cetera. So one idea is, most of the time you don't run single program when you run multiple separate program or in this case it's called multi-program workload right there's no sharing across each program so you can kind of freely run them on each processor a different idea can be something like i can run each thread right and you have a multi-threaded application i can run each thread on each core right and these generate a separate issue with multiprocessor for so these idea on I'm going to run different program or I'm going to run different threads on each of these processing core, they are going to basically generate different problems to the multi-core processor. So one of the key issues is the resource are share, L2 cache, last level cache are share, the main memory are share amongst all the processing core as we've seen earlier through the memory scheduling lecture, right? There has to be a way to prioritize certain things while reduce the priority of some other things that maybe are not as important. How can we do that, right? How to prevent application that take all the resources? How to ensure data coherencies? Uh, we'll talk about what does coherency means in a bit. How to ensure data consistency? Again, we'll also talk about what is data consistency in a bit. Both of these are really, really important in most distributed system <coughs> and things like IoT, right? Especially in, in, in our region, like Southeast Asia and like third world country, we all always overlook this problem, but it's one of the most absolute important problem when you talk about IoT and people don't understand it. How to schedule what to run and when and what core, right? If I want to map, a thread in the multi-threaded program. If I have multiple core, can how do I make the scheduling? Because you're gonna have more threads, 
than the number of core that you have. Right? Let's say you have eight threads and you have only four processing core. How do you take, make sure each thread would take turn, right? And use the core resources to run the program. So now, <clears throat> the first half of the lecture, I'm going to start talking about the first two bullet points, right? How am I supposed to share my resource? And how do I prevent an application to take up all the resources to the point that no one else can use it, right? Because these two are important. In this kind of dive, now we can dive into this topic we call, how do I manage application interference? What does interference mean? Interference means that I have one actor, right? That interfere with the operation of another actor. In this case, right? I have multiple apps that want to use the resource that are being shared. So every single application need to use this main memory, for example, right? By default, they would issue the cache access. And then if it's missed in the cache, what would happen? It would have to go to the main memory, right? The problem with this uh, uh, assumption is some applications are more demanding than others, right? I can write an application always have to go to the cache, and then this has a really, really poor cache locality. So it would have to evict, right? other applications data from the cache. It costs thrashing. <clears throat> another application can have a really, really high row buffer hit rate, preventing other application from accessing DRAM because the, the scheduler, which prefer to use FRFCFS policy, would try right, to schedule this DRAM request and that would favor application with high row buffer hits. So the problem is, uh, this would increase the time it takes for your processor to process, load, and store. This also would make the load store latency unpredictable. What do I mean by making this unpredictable? For example, if I have a workload like self-driving car, right? Is there a deadline with certain things in self-driving car? Can you give me an example of deadlines that I have to absolutely make sure I finish computation before certain thing happen in self-driving car. Uh, like at a uh, distance of a certain object, you have to compute that before the car uh, reaches uh, very close to that, uh, like that. Yeah, I mean, exactly, right? You want to be able to detect all the objects before the collision happen, because if you don't know what that object is, you would crash. You'll see news about detection algorithm going wrong, right? Many, many cases already on the news. For example, the, the Tesla quote-unquote autopilot has been hitting certain objects and they have to reiterate how they process that. But one of the things they have to make sure is by the time that, uh, by the time that I see the object, I better know what that object is before I hit that object, right? The problem is, if you have unpredictable load and store, what could it mean is, I won't be able to tell, can I finish my computation before I hit it up, this object? One of the common solution in real-time embedded system, are you taking embedded system class as well? Uh, uh, no, I will uh, take that. I think in the next semester it is. Oh, next semester. Okay. So one of the really important topic in embedded system. I hope we cover this in the embedded system class, but I have no idea, right? Uh, because I haven't really checked uh, <clears throat> the the detail. Is real time deadline? Real time does not mean fast. This is a stupid misunderstanding. I don't know why. Real time doesn't mean fast. Real time means that I have a deadline and I better not miss the deadline. The deadline can be really long. I just need to make sure I don't miss the deadline. One example of something that has a deadline is your monitor, right? You have to refresh every, say, if you have 60 hertz monitor, that would be one every 60 of the second, I need to draw a new picture. Why is it bad to miss the deadline? Can, can you give me an example? What could have happened if I missed the deadline? Let's say I play a game. Is it, I getting 60 frames per second, I get 20. What would happen to the user? Mm. 
Uh, actually, the game will then not uh, be as much smooth, and uh, and the user, I think, will. Uh, I'll feel dizzy. Say, right? Yes. Yeah, because if I play play like a first person shooting game, and somehow I cannot like generate uh sixty frame per second, what could have happened? That's gonna really really feel dizzy. And on top of it, right, you you won't feel that the frame are smooth, especially if there's a variation in frame per second, right? So that's a bad thing. These are example of what we call soft deadline. Soft deadline, soft real time deadline means it's okay to miss. Well, it's not okay to miss, but if you miss it, no one die. The example of an object in self driving car is more like a hard real time deadline. You better not miss it because if you miss that deadline, someone can die, right? So this is an important topic in embedded system and IoT. If you miss a deadline with drone, like uh, the fleet of drone or fleet of cars, thing would crash, right? Unpredictable latency for load and store increase the problem over here. It exacerbate the problem. What can you do? Most of the time in the real time embedded system scenario what ended up happening is most of the time your pro the programmer would make sure it's only one thing run right whenever there's a deadline only one thing would be running at the same time so so there's no sharing or they would isolate the sharing right isolate the amount of sharing so you don't see the interference from multiple applications so that you, how you can guarantee is that a, the best solution no, right? A better solution while is still being researched and trying to make sure we can guarantee these, right? And prove that we can guarantee this is how can we truly share shared resources without underutilizing your shared resources? Because you hopefully you get better utility of your hardware, right? So how do you manage application interference in both the cache and the DRAM? So let's talk about the cache first. For the cache, right? One observation is application benefit from the cache differently. If I increase the cache to application A, it might yield a different performance improvement compared to a different application, application B. Why is that the case? Because you write code with loops, right? For example, you have a, a nested loop, three, three loops, like one loop inside another loop inside another loop. Let's say you can have enough cash to cash everything in the innermost loop, right? You're going to see performance improvement quite a lot because whenever you have to iterate in the innermost loop, you see the better cash utilization. And then when you have to go across the, the innermost loop to the, the outer loop, if you cannot, right, if you cannot cash the data in there, you're not going to see a lot of benefit until you can cache most of the data in the, the next level of the loop. So the utility is different. That's this thing called performance cliff. At some point, you no longer get the performance benefit by adding more cache to the application. Sometimes because the data actually, the working set is too big, right? You cannot cache the next level of the nested loop. Sometimes it's just the matter of you already catch everything inside the working set at the time, so you're not going to see additional benefit. So one idea based on this observation is I can do cache partitioning. How do I do this? I can ensure right, that each application would take n ways. n ways means the associativity that I can control from the hardware. These can be assigned statically or adjusted dynamically based on our design, right? So, I mean, the current processor doesn't have this, but that's quite a lot of proposals saying, hey, we can do this. Uh, and with this design, like, let's say, what if there are a lot of application and you don't have that many cache ways, right? Do you don't have a lot of associativity to give to all uh, the application. In this case, you can still share right, some ways among different applications, but if you absolutely know that these applications demand like, two additional ways, you can isolate them. The benefit here is you provide certain amount of isolation, ensuring that the application that you're running have some 
of its own private resource. The second idea is you can do with, uh, you can basically manage the cache replacement policy that would be based on each application characteristics. What do I mean by that? I can use different cache replacement and insertion policy, and we talk about this quite a bit in the caching lecture. We will now dive deeper into okay, now that we have multiple processor, how can we manage the cache better in terms of replacement and insertion? One thing I can do is I can try to make sure the <clears throat> the data that I might not use again in the LIU position because they would likely to be ejected right away. I can try to detect hot data. Hot data means that I use the data often. Cold data is I use it once, I use it a few times, and I'm done. I don't need it anymore. I would try to proactively evict cold data, and I would try to pro proactively maintain the hot data in the cache. This is one of the most important te techniques for caching across every phase of computer science, not just hardware caching in the processor, but things like software caching in database application, web application, uh, webcast, when you have to download like the, some of the uh, packets from the internet, your computer try to cache some of those data as well. Trying to detect hot data is one of the key idea that use everywhere. Another idea is let's say you have the the cache block that always, it has a lot of reuse, but it always gets evicted by someone else, right? We can use what we call a victim cache. Victim cache doesn't always have to be a full-blown cache, but it's only contained like a tag store of the commonly used cache blocks, but somehow get trashed out of the cache. Because these cache block has value, you want to make sure it stay in the cache, right? So you would maintain this information and say, hey, do I have any cash block that get evicted but has a lot of reuse? If so, we can try to ensure that that block is not evicted again, right? So one thing you can do is when you are about to do eviction, you check the victim cache and is the cache tag there? If the tag is there, you don't evict the cache block because it suggests that this cache block just got another access. So you don't want to eat the cache block. Professor, that's a really functional tiny cache. Yes. Uh, evicted means cache miss in this case, like uh, cache miss of a block. So let's say I have a, a, a cache access, right? Evict that means that the cache is full. I bring something in. I need to find something in the cache to kick out. So that's eviction. Right. And in this case, right, what I need to ensure is if I have some sad cache block that I have a lot of reuse, I want to make, be in the cache, but because there's so many applications that want to use the cache, I got kicked out. I, I can maintain a, a pseudo cache where I store just the tag. I store just the tag. And then if I have access again to this tag, it means I have reuse, right? I am going to get access again. I maintain the tag, and if I see this in my victim cache, I do not evict the cache block. And then I find another cache block to evict. Uh, what are other ideas that you can do, right? You can reduce interference at the cache in uh, using things like cache bypassing. Cache bypassing is, let's say you have the, the program that reads something once and you're done. For example, you open a file, right? And you go through the file. How many times are you going to read through the file? How many times are you going to process the file before these things get stored in some array or something? You're going to go through the file once, right? And that's it, you're done. You're done with the file. Then you are basically dealing with the the actual data in the file, right? So you can bypass some of these access. Don't use the cache, go directly to the main memory. You can do cache insertion and eviction policy. For example, I'm going to talk about the two ideas here. Uh, the first idea is adaptive insertion policy for high performance caching in ISCA 2007. And another idea 
uh, in ISCA 2010. ISCA is like the top conference for architecture. Basically, it's like the best conference in in our field, right? The uh, ISCA, Micro, HPCA, and ASOS. The 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 paper, for example, the reading list paper that I give you, these are considered as like nature paper in science. Like this is the absolute best uh, venue that that works in architecture would go to. Uh, we, because we, we don't submit to those uh, uh, journal. <clears throat> but here are the two papers I'm going to talk about today uh, that has to do with insertion and eviction policy. Yes. So cash partitioning policy, where you can find a uh, 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 some techniques to partition the cash. And note that these are uh, papers from uh, close to 15 years ago for some of them. Some of them are more than 15 years ago. That's also like advances in how you cash. Uh, and for example, this idea that have to do with the performance cliff that I said I mentioned earlier, uh, that was recently published uh, not too long ago as well, right? So feel free to check those out. Let me know if you're curious about it. But let me talk about these policy because it, it's kind of follow up from our like our primitive cash design. All right. So the dynamic insertion policy or the first paper that we're going to talk about uh, kind of extend, right? The extend the idea of the bimodal insertion policy. What do I mean by that? So most cash insertion are done at the M. And this is small probably. So in the bimodal insertion policy, I have two policy and I'm going to, with some small probability, I'm going to put this cash block in the LIU position. Why is this good? It would take care of some requests that you go through the file. One, for example, you put that in the LRU, they get evicted soon because you would evict the LRU block. Right? But these are not perfect, right? Because you use probability, but you, you don't really have a systematic way to tell what should be at the MIU, what should be at the LRU. You can use a dynamic policy where you would pick the better of the default. Default is MIU insertion policy and our bimodal insertion policy. And then the decision is done through the process called set dueling. Set dueling would make this more systematic. What does set dueling do? I have a lot of cash set in my cash, right? So one thing I can do is I would pick some set to use MIU some other set use BIP, and I will let them duel. See which one's better. The one that's better wins, and the remaining set, the follower set, would be selected by the policy that yield the least number of cash mess. So that's the idea of the dynamic insertion policy on the ISCA 2007 paper, right? You would make sure that you prioritize the policy that gives you the best misread and the set dueling is a cost effective way to measure how should I like what policy should I use whether it's MIU or BIP. All right, so that's the first paper. The second paper is called RIP. Um, these the idea of this is. This one is more designed to save cost to make the design of insertion policy simpler, right? So one thing that are good to do is I want to insert the block near the end of the most recently used list instead of at the end. Why is that the case? Because new block can sometimes be not getting reused at all, right? So you might want to prioritize highly reused cache block. The problem with this is there's this thing called a list that you have to maintain, right? Maintaining a list is costly. You don't want to maintain the list. So one thing you can do is you can use the uh, multiple bit version of not recently used policy where let's say you have four cache block here, cache block one, two, three, and four. If I have a ac an access to a cache line, I would reset the number in this counter i will add counter to all the cash block so let's say right now counter is four five one and seven and then i have access to this cash block seven i will reset it so the seven turns into zero 
and then I'm going to increment everything else. This go to two, this go to six, and this go to five. When I need to evict something, I would evict the block with the maximum number of counter here because that suggests here I haven't used this for a, for a while. Relative to the other cache block, I haven't used this yet, right? Then if I have a new thing coming in, right, to this cache block, the initial value, right? So originally this is five, six, two, zero, and you kick this out. If you put a new block in, you would assign the value to be maximum minus one, so it's going to be four. This eliminate the fact that we actually have to maintain the list. So we don't need the list, we just need four counters, well, I mean one counter per cache blocks, right? This is much, 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 much easier to maintain. It's much more cost effective way to maintain your cache blocks and the cache blocks information. All right, another policy is called UCP. So this is more uh, of the idea of how do I partition the cache for each processor, right? Because each processor that runs different application has different affinity to the amount of cache given to them, right? They have different affinity to uh, the amount of cache that are given to them. So, right, so. What I can do is I can try, right? I can try to figure out how much of the cash should I give it to each application, right? Because if I can figure it out, I would assign the certain number of way to that core that are running on each, uh, that, that are running the application, and then ensuring, right? Ensuring that this is, like the, the, the utility that you get from assigning it this way is maximum. How do you do this in hardware? The problem, the main hard problem is, okay, this sounds awesome. How do I do this in hardware? How do I define utility? And how I I'm going to define what to do and how to track, how to track your utility because hardware are not free, right? So to do this, the paper's idea is I'm going to maintain what we call a shadow cache. A shadow cache, similar to the victim cache, but it's, it is basically shadow, the main cache, and it only contain the tag. It only contain the tag. Why is this good? If I have a shadow cache that only have to maintain the tag, I don't need to maintain the data, so it's just the area required is a lot smaller. The shadow cache would estimate the hit rate as if the application has n ways of L2. So it would try to estimate the hit rate if I give them more cache for the core, right? If I give them more of the shared cache to the core. Why is this good? The way to estimate without actually, right? Do I, am I going to get benefit compared to other applications core? So let's say these are all there, right? You then collect the statistics and then reassign the number of ways to each core based on what you observe in the shadow cache. Now the next question, right? The next question is, okay, how can I make, this seems like a good idea, right? But how can I make this cheap? Because shadow cache, again, are not free, right? It's just a big area for tax store. So to further reduce the overhead, one thing that you can do is to use set sampling. Again, you would just do the shadow cache for certain number of sets, and you sample that, assuming that you collect enough sample that it convey the correct, uh, correct partitioning information, right? So this is how you can uh, design the cache in a way that you can allowing multiple applications to use the resource while trying to limit right, interference. Interference means that I, I, I'm trying to limit the amount of uh, say things like trashing or, or uh, denial of resource from another application. So this kind of conclude the cache management part that has to do with the cache thrashing problem. Cache thrashing is when you have one application kicking 
other applications data out. Right? So that's the thrashing problem. Another problem is the compulsory mess, right? The compulsory mess is when you have the new access that you never seen before. I never seen this address before. So if you don't do anything, it will be a cache mess. There's no way you can predict what what you're gonna access, right? And when I said no way you can predict what to access, it's a little bit uh, not true, right? Because you can do something like prefetching. The idea, the idea is you can ask yourself, is this possible? Can I predict, right? Can I predict the address of my future data access given the history of my past access? Can I do that? Is it possible? The answer is yeah. I mean, you can totally try, right? A program that would linearly stream through the data in an array, for example, can be easily predict what is the next address. How common is this? So let's say you write a program that do this for like i equals zero, i is less than n, i plus plus, right? And I do a of i equals zero, right? I go through all the elements in my array. This is a common thing that a lot of programmers do all the time in the program, right? So the idea is, well, if we can predict that trend can be common, why can't we prefetch? Prefetch means I'm going to go ahead and bring the data in to my cache ahead of time, right? Some more complex operation are things like graph traversal. Oh, can we do this, right? Can we try to prefetch the node based on your current position in the graph? Uh, this is harder, but it's doable. What are the possible list of nodes that you're going to access based on where you are in the graph? I hope you, you are familiar with the graph, graph algorithm like Bedford Search, Shortest Path, right? Or even PageRank that we use by Google Search. Um, so with this, right, the solution is, hey, I want to be able to bring this data into the cache beforehand, before they are actually getting used. Seems like a good solution. It seems like a good solution. What could be the problem? The design issue is, if I am going to design a prefecture, or if I'm going to design a prefecture, the hard part is the following. Right? The hard part is the following. First, it has to be accurate. Right? You want to prefetch the correct address. That's obvious. I don't want to issue random requests and accuracy is 1%. I want to be able to have the accurate prediction. It should be timely. What does timely mean? If I need the address A at cycle 1000, it better arrive right close to cycle 1000. If it arrived too early, you're thrashing the cache. If it arrived too late, it's useless because by that time you already need the data. It should be bandwidth efficient. It means it the coverage. You don't want to send thousands and thousands of prefetch requests, and then only it turns out only 10 of them are useful, the rest are useless. Right? So these are the coverage for all the prefetch requests, how much coverage do you get? Which is calculated as for all the prefetch requests, how many that you actually use. So one thing we can do that are simple, right? And it's actually being proposed and might be utilized in certain architecture is a stream or stride prefetcher. What is a stream? Okay, my bad. Forget about this. Uh, the key idea of the stream prefetcher is if you can detect this trend, a plus n, a plus 2n, a plus 3n, et cetera, et cetera, what would be your guess for the next access? If you have to guess the next access. A plus uh, four n and so on. Yeah, exactly, right? It it is yes. is that's a stride that you observe. So your prefetcher would fetch, right? 
a plus 4n and likely a plus 5n in the cache to make sure when you see the next access, you hit in the cache, even though you never seen this address before, right? Another idea is we can use Markov model. Right? The idea is, hey, I can use Markov model to predict the probability of my access to the other address. So let's say I have a node in a graph, right? So let's say this is my graph. I can, from here, and I do graph traversal. I can go from here to here, to here, and to here. What's the probability P that I will go into each of these edge? I can predict it using Markov model. And then based on the Markov model, if there's a high probability that I'm gonna go into, for example, this edge, right, with the 0.99%, I mean, not 0 0.99, 99%, I'm gonna go in here. I will prefetch that node. Seems like a good idea. What are the potential downside of this? What could be the potential downside of this? This design that I use Markov model. So how do I keep track, right? How do I keep track of all this history? It, it does, it's not free, right? Keeping track of this history is not free you need certain, uh, you can use hardware, for example, to keep track of this, but it, it wears the transistor. So if the model is not accurate, it's useless. So the downside to address the downside, you need to have a systematic way to detect what are you gonna prefetch. One way that has been proposed uh, is called spatial memory streaming. The observation is from, from the papers, if I run a uh, commercial workload like database, key value store, right? These are common commercial workload that get run all the time in most computer system, right? You will see that there are repetitive layout that actually cover right, a huge region of memory, but you see repetitive layout. You cannot, right? You cannot store all these patterns in the most naive sense. If you do it naively, you will run out of memory. You cannot store that. Idea is, well, instead of storing everything, I would maintain the pattern history table, similar to the branch predictor, but it's a little bit different in, in the sense of how we use it. I would maintain the pattern history table that store the repeated pattern and the associated address. So I know that if I see this path for the cache block again, I know what are the other access that I have to fetch. Uh, this is proposed by Stephen Somoji uh, at uh, ISCA 2006. The idea is called Spatial Memory Stream Streaming as uh, the title suggests. And here is how it's designed, right? So you will add the active generation table that accumulate right accumulate the information this is when you build the history how you built it is from this example let's say i have access to a plus three a plus two and a plus zero and then i evict a plus two so there are three accesses three accesses to a the first access is we will store the program counter of the first access with the offset from the tag the tag is going to be a the offset is three the offset is three. Then you store, if that's a future access to the same tag with some offset, again, you store the tag in the accumulation table. The accumulation table, the purpose is to build the pattern, is to build the pattern. We are, use, we are gonna use this pattern in the future. We want to build the pattern. Now you have access to A plus three and then A plus two, right? If you look at A, A plus one, A plus two, and A plus three, that's one access to A plus T, that's one access to A plus two, that's why the pattern is zero, zero, one, one, because there's no access to A and A plus one. Then there's an access to A plus zero, so you flip this bit to be one, saying, hey, that's also A, if you see A plus three, that's also the access to A plus two coming afterward, and then access to A plus zero coming afterward, that's why the pattern is one, zero, one, one. Then when you evict A plus two in here, 
you move this entry because now you're done with the tag A, you say, hey, if you see A plus three, get A plus two and A. You're done. You want to move this to the pattern history table, which is highlighted here. Right, so the, the way pattern history table work is once you move that here, you store the tag, for example, the tag A, right? Then you see, let's say you see the address that map to the tag A again, you check the table, oh, it's matched here, it's matched here. Then what do I do is I'll take this entry, in this case, 11010000, and fetch everything that I see in the pattern. A plus zero, A plus one. You don't fetch A plus two because it's zero, so you'd fetch A plus three. You don't fetch A plus four, plus five, plus six, plus seven. You then fetch A plus eight. You don't fetch A plus nine, but you fetch A plus ten, and you don't fetch A plus eleven. You then go get A plus zero, A plus one, A plus three, A plus eight, and A plus ten, because the last time you see this tag, you see a plus zero, a plus one, a plus three, a plus eight, and a plus ten. This is how the idea works. Right? This is how the idea works. Another way you can prefetch is instead of predicting, you run kind of ahead of the stream and see, okay, what are the address that I am going to have to access? This school of ideas called the more like a leader follower execution. The question that we are going to ask is, can we use one processor to fetch the data for another processor? Right? Can I use one processor to fetch another data for, for, for a different processor? Because I have multi-core processor, I can sometimes have underutilization. I run two programs, I have four core, I have empty cores that, that are not running anything. Right? So the idea is, if I have a processor that are not doing anything, I can use that processor to pick up the program counter that are running on a different processor, I would run ahead of time and check what's the address, what's the address, what's the address, what's the address. Because once you know the address of future accesses, go and get them. Go and get them. Put that in the share cache. Put that in the share cache. This is done by what we call the A stream, the stream of the instruction that run ahead then you fetch the data in your share cache for the real processor that are running the program. Every time I have the access, I hit in the cache. In some sense, the A stream would fetch the data for the R stream ahead of time. So this is the idea behind leader follower execution, which has been proposed in uh, actually multiple uh, papers. And then there's another paper that say, hey, this this is a good idea, but it has redundant execution, right? It use a different core to prefetch the data for yourself. Another idea is why can't we use the same processor? This is called run ahead execution. So with the leader follower execution, we kind of need two processors. Can we go with one, right? The idea of run ahead execution is when you have a long latency stall, you continue fetching. You stop the CPU from making progress and commit to the write back. But you keep fetching future instruction. You keep fetching future instruction. Why is that good? Why is that good? When you fetch future instruction, then do nothing except when you see a load and store and you see the address. Right? Whenever you see the address, sorry, my cat is behind me and need to make sure he doesn't knock things out. Um, when you see the address, you fetch them because these are future instruction. These are future instructions, you, so you are guaranteed that you're going to have to access really soon. Why is that good? So this is basically the diagram of, of the timeline, if you will, right? I run application, app A, and I have a load store. And let's say I have a load. I will stall, right? Do nothing. Load to A uh, address. I guess load to address X. I'm going to stall because I have to wait for the load to address X. In the meantime, I'm going to keep fetching, right? I will checkpoint. I will make a checkpoint here. 
and then I'm going to keep fetching new instruction come in so that I can figure out if there's any address Y, C, A, B, and C in the meantime over here, right? So I can go and fetch them into my cache. The benefit is kind of twofold. First, you do the prefetch. Second, you take advantage of the memory level parallelism because DRAM can handle multiple parallel requests, right? In this case, instead of sending one access to address X, you send six access to address X, Y, C, A, B, and C at the same time, right? While you are trying to process the value at the at address X, right? So this is the benefit. And when you're done, when you get X back, when X come back here, you then recover the checkpoint, right? How do we recover and how do we checkpoint? That's the key, one of the key things here because it's not easy. And the paper uh, actually proposed by my advisor, Ona Mutlu, uh, it's called Run Ahead Execution, an alternative to very large instruction windows or all other processor in HP 2003, uh, proposed a, a hardware design that would do this. Because the high level idea is actually uh, uh, nice, right? It, it, it allow you to reduce the cost. At the same time, hopefully be effective at fetching new address as if you have a large instruction windows. The idea itself actually just got the HPCA Tesla Time Award uh, in this year, 2021. The Tesla Time Award, uh, I'll, I'll go sidetrack a little bit. This is the award given to only uh, basically each year they'll give out the test of award to one paper and the paper would have to be old like uh, more than 15 years ago uh, in this case of HP I think it's 18 years or more and then the paper would have to make so much impact to how you design the processor and the award is given to the paper that makes such an impact right so this is the the paper that got the award in 2021 it's a pretty big achievement and you can see the trail of additional research that spawn after this idea. There's quite a lot of, uh, so this is the overview of how it's designed. Um, this shows uh, the, the, the shaded area here, show the components being added for run ahead execution in order to make sure you do two things. The first thing is to actually running ahead, right? And the second thing is to make sure you can checkpoint and come back to the checkpoint. When you have the data back, you need to checkpoint and come back to the old program counter, right? There's a lot of details that go into the idea of the paper, and there's a lot of detail on how to realize this, right? Is the one paper doesn't make, it's not enough, like 12 page paper, is not enough to answer every single question about the design. So there's quite a lot of follow-up work after the first original paper that kind of proposed additional idea to optimize this overall concept of run ahead execution. All right, so that's the idea behind things you can do to make the cache performance better, to make the application run faster. What else can we do? We can handle DRAM interference, such as uh, allowing application to occupy more or less of the capacity, more or less of the bandwidth, and more or less of the priority in uh, getting service by DRAM. So there are multiple ideas being proposed. The first idea is partitioning DRAM, similar to cache partitioning, where you can partition channel banks and the bandwidth itself. In this way, you can make sure that some channel or some bank are isolated and protect from application that would flood out DRAM. You can also partition DRAM capacity to each application through the OS, through the technique we call page coloring. You can also do DRAM scheduling. We are gonna kind of briefly go over this because we went over this already in DRAM lecture. You can use the memory scheduler to determine what application should be prioritized. This can ensure fairness when you run multiple applications how do we do this? You would embed the application ID and track the application behavior in a way that you can prioritize properly 
what application should get more service and what application should get less service. One more idea is the page management mechanism, right? Because this is more like the capacity, how do you manage the capacity of DRAM that are limited, right? The OS also can determine what data would be stored in DRAM and what should be stored in the swap in the storage, right? This control the application, what data goes into the main memory and what data would have to go to page fault process and access the disk. This can be heavily utilized when your memory is limited. It, when you have limited memory, which again is important in, in some cases like embedded system, uh, including when you have a, a mid-tier or low-tier laptop or mobile phone. These are really, really important, right? So it can be utilized when memory is limited. What else? If you have unpredictable latency, right? As we mentioned already and we talked about already, if you have self-driving car, thing would crash. If you have power grid, for example, there's many of your friends here in the EC program that are still uh, working in electric, like a, a power system, right? If you have a large power grid, if you cannot re respond to the hard deadline, power outage can happen, right? Which is bad. You can have running a cloud uh, services and manage the predictability of how long my task would take, right? Then you can charge different clients for different amount of money, right? The people that pay more money should have more priority than people who pay less money. Pro providing this form of predictability is extremely important and it's a very active area of research in both architecture and the OS area, right? Uh, this is absolutely important when you talk about cloud computing. This is one of the is not overlooked in the international world, but people in Thailand, including people in developing countries, they still don't have an idea what is cloud computing. So what can happen is people think that, hey, uh, the ability to write program and run it on AWS, that's cloud computing. No, if you want to actually maintain infrastructure for the cloud, and maintain the policy of managing things you run in the cloud. That's actually truly the cloud computing I want to talk about, right? It's a much, much, much harder problem. And it's a problem that actually getting more and more and more important as time goes on, because a lot of time these days you would put, for example, part of the program running that in a container in the cloud, right? So the idea is, well, can you provide some latency guarantee? for our in-flight request, for example, can you provide the worst case guarantee of all these ongoing requests so that you can measure when my application would finish or when my uh, request would finish, all right? Uh, so that's it for the first part of the lecture. Uh, we are going to now take a break before we dive into the next idea called cache coherency. My recommendation is go get coffee. You need to be awake for this because it can be confusing, right? It can be confusing. This is one of the uh, topic that can confuse people if you are not fully awake. So we will take, let's do a 15. We actually, I think I finished way earlier than I in, intended to for this first part. So let's do a 15 minutes break. We'll meet again around 10, 12. Is that okay? Oh, yes, oh, yes. All right, so go get coffee. Make sure you're awake uh, for this topic because if you are awake and you understand how it works, it's really simple. But there are many things going on. So if you get confused just a bit, you can lose track. So so make sure you're awake before you come back. Uh, I can ensure you this go on to the, the midterm as well, this topic, right? Um, not the midterm, the final. So let's do a 15 minute break. We'll see you in uh, 15 minutes.
All right, go back, I guess. Uh, okay, so uh, shall I continue? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll continue on with the concept of cash coherency. And what do I mean by coherency? This is what is, uh, what, what happened, right? Let's say I have the program running on two processor and they share the virtual address that has the same data. Basically, it's the same shared variable from the program. In multiprocessor, I can share the cache, right? But but you have the level one private cache. So this is what I mean. I have int i, right? And this is share for both thread uh, A and thread B, right? So now you have processor one and processor two. Each one of them has its own private cache, right? L1 cache, and you have to share cache, L2 cache. Thread A is run here, thread B is running here. And let's say this variable I is in every thread cache, right? This variable I, I is here, I is here, and I is here, right? Initially, let's say the value is one. And then thread A modified the value from one to five. I said, now the new value is five. What's going on here? What's the problem? Uh, thread uh, two needed uh, the early value like one, but it will get five. So uh, yeah. like there will be no synchronization or interlocking mechanism. Yeah, exactly, right? You need a way to make sure the information is coherent in the sense that processor two should have the updated value if processor two want to access this variable, right? So the question is this, how can we maintain this coherency across different cache? So how do I impose coherency? This is the high, I'm gonna show you the high level idea because we will use this idea and improve on it. The high level idea is I would add the status to each cache line because if it's shared and someone access it, I want to be to to be able to update the status. And if it's read only, every core can access the data because if no one modified the data yet, I can just read the data. It's guaranteed that the data will not change, right? If I have the right to a cache line, what do I have to do? If someone modified the data in a cache, what does that person have to do? Like it will uh, send its ID, I think. Yeah, you need to update the status, right? You need to notify your friend saying, hey, I have the new data. And your friends need to be aware that someone else update the data so that you need to synchronize later. So you need a way to communicate and update the status of my data, right? This is called the cache coherence protocol. And the goal of the protocol is, I mean, let's say I have to write to the data and every time I, up, I update my data, I have to yell to everyone, right? If I update the data, I have to communicate to everyone. That can be costly. So the goal is to find a way to minimize this communication and minimize the data transfer that you have to do. Because every time you have to do this, it makes read access taking longer. It also consumes more power, right? So here's cache coherence 101. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to invalidate your own data if some other people write to that same cache block, right? So if in that scenario that I showed earlier, I have processor one and processor two, the processor one thread update the data from one to five, right? from one to five, processor two need to be aware of this and invalidate the value one in the processor's two private cache. 
In this way, when I go to access the data again, what will happen? I would have to go to the L2 cache to get the updated data and get it back to processes to private cache. This is to ensure safety. I get the most updated version of the data. So the processor would have to observe every other processor action, right, through a bus, and this is called a Snoopy bus. The reason why we call this Snoopy bus, uh, just to help remembering the name, right, is 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 the same as snooping around when you let's say you have cats or dogs, right? They will snoop around a lot to get information. The same thing, I'm sorry, the same thing would go to here, right? You have a bus that allow the processor ones and two to share information. If I have write to the, the variable I, right? Over here, the variable I, one, one, one. Let's say I update this to five. I need to tell everyone that I'm writing, writing to this cache block so that processor two, when they listen to this, they say, okay, I'm gonna invalidate this, invalidate. So that's the goal, because if you see invalid cache block, you would search here. Over here, it has to be marked as dirty so that you have to write back. In a way, this become five, so that if you need to use it, the value five get communicated to processor two. And then, oh, it's here, take it. <coughs> <coughs> and again, the goal is to minimize this communication because it's a long, oh, it, it's a, it can be a tedious process because every time you have to access the data, you have to communicate. So one protocol is called the MSI protocol. MSI protocol, the letter stands for the state name. Each block can have one of the three states. M is for modified, S is for share, I is invalid. I is probably the simplest. If my cache block is in the invalid state, I don't have the data. The data is updated by someone else. If my cache block is in a shared state, it means that I can read the data, but someone else might also have the data as well. If I have the modified state, it means that it means that I modify the data. Someone else who has the data has to change from share to invalid because I only have the I'm, I'm the only one who has the updated version of the data. So if you read any data, if you issue a read, you would transition to a share state. Why is that the case? Because I'm going to have the most updated version of the data and everyone else who has this version of the data is going to be share um, uh, with me. So in this example, I have processor one and processor two, right? I read, so over here, let's say I have the data, I'm in a share state. I read, I'm gonna have a share state as well. And as you can see now, the data is shared between processor one and processor two. If I have a write miss, I modify the data. I modify the data, this is what happened. I'm gonna transition. So let's say processor one modify the data. I'm going to transition this to M. I modify it. And I send the read exclusive signal to the bus, right? So let's, let's, let me use a different color for the bus that everyone see. I send read exclusive saying, hey, I just modified the data and I have the exclusive access to the read to, the, to this data. Processor two see that has to change this, the state, and invalidate this to I. This would ensure that every time, if processor two need to read this data, it need to get the updated version of the data. So this means that if I transition from share to modify, the benefit is I can do this without reading data from the main memory. This reduce communication already. Right, this it reduces the communication already. The only time that you have to kind of update everyone if, if I modify the data. What are the problem? What are the problem? So this is good, but it can be better. One of the problem is, let's say you run multiple program on processor one, processor two, processor three, and processor four. It's a totally different program. Let me ask you this question. Do they share any data? 
if we run different program, do I do they share data? Um, no, I think it's probably no. different. Yes, you're correct. Most of the time, the data running in each program are not shared, right? So if I write to the data, do I have to communicate? If I'm not sharing it with anyone else, do I have to inform the other browser, hey, hey, I write the data, I update the data? That's uh, not the no, case. Okay. So one thing that are wrong with my share state is that I can be the only owner. I will, I'm the only one who has the share state. I'm in the S state, everyone else is I. Everyone else has the I state. So if I have a read to this, I would go directly to the share state, even though I have the only copy, right? This can potentially be done in many cases in, pro in the real execution of the program, right? You run different program, you don't have the shared data. So I can update without notifying everyone. So the improvement to this policy or this protocol is to add one more state. It's called messy pro coherent protocol. You can add the exclusive state. So this is more like, uh, if you read textbook in computer architecture, you see this as a default uh, coherence protocol. The exclusive state dictate that I have the data and I'm the only one who have the data and I have not write to it yet. So it's non-dirty block. I don't have to update the, 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 the level two cache. I have an issue right to the cache block and I have the only copy. This means that I can transition from E to M. If I write, if I write to this block, I don't have to inform everyone. I don't have to inform everyone. And this is a common pattern. This is a common thing that happened. So if I can do this, transition from E to M and E to M is a common thing, I don't have to use the Snoopy bus to inform everyone else. So this can significantly reduce the communication. So let's actually talk about how does it work, right? So this is where I guess coffee would should help. Uh, let's say I have read versus write. One thing you have to remember when I write, I modify the data. When I read, I just need to get the correct data. So the key issue is you need to propagate the updated data to everyone. You need to minimize communication because it slows things down and you want to update only if you have to. And each of the cache block would maintain the state, the MESI state. And it has two things. If processor do something, mean read or write, to the same cache block, right? You have to update the state. If someone else, if someone else do something to the cache block, you also have to update the state. So here are the state M, E, S, and I. I will start with the exclusive state. The cache block is not dirty. What do we do? If I read, if I, I if I am in the E state and I read to the cache block. If I read, I don't modify the data, so I stay here, right? Self, issue a read. If I write, if I write to the cache block, I can transition self, right? Write without notifying everyone. I would silently transition this. I would silently do a self read. I would silently self write, don't have to notify anyone. So the red text here is mean, I do I send any other signal? I don't have to. If I'm in the exclusive state, right? And someone else, someone else read, someone else read, I would transition to share, other, read. Or if other people write, I would then invalidate. because I, I don't have the most updated copy of the data anymore. Then if I'm in a modified state and I modify it again, right, self, write. If I'm in the modified state, one thing I have to do, if I write it again, I need to issue it saying, hey, I am doing a write so that everyone else who might have the data have to invalidate this. 
Wait. No, you don't have to do that, actually. But this is where confusion comes in. Because if I'm in a modified state, everyone else should have invalid state anymore, so they don't have to update. It's already invalid. If I'm in a modified state and I read to the to the cache block, right? I'll stay there. If I'm in a modified state, someone someone read on this cache block, I would have to transition to the share state, other read, and then I would also have to perform the write back. Because I need to make sure that someone need to get the correct cache block. Right. If someone else in this case write right to the cache block, then I'm gonna transition to invalid. Because that person would have the most copy, most updated copy of the data. I don't have the most copy, uh, most updated copy anymore. If I'm in a shared state and I issue a read, I stay there because it's, I don't modify the data. If someone else issue a read, I also stay there because no one update the data. If someone else update the data, I move to invalid. If I update the data, I move to modify. And if I move to modify, I need to issue the uh, signal to say I write to the data in the Snoopy bus because you need to inform everyone else. If I'm in the invalid state and I read, if I read, I would have to transition to the share state because I will have the most updated version of the data now. If I write to the data, I would transition to the modify. And because I write to the data and someone else might have this cache block, so I need to tell everyone that I do a write. If I'm in the invalid state and someone else writes, I stay there because I don't have the most updated version of the data anyway. And if someone read the data, I also stay there because I don't have the most updated version of the data. The status is mine and mine status alone. I just need to make sure I'm in the correct status and I issue the correct signal. In this case, the signal that you have to issue, right, is let's say I read, I read and I'm in a share state. To share state suggests that someone else might have the data. Right, someone else might have the data. And if that person is in the exclusive state, I need to update them and tell, hey, someone else read to the data, so I need to update my status from exclusive to share. So the red text are where you have to send a signal. The blue text is how the transition works. All right, so this is the protocol. And to visualize this, Right. Let's say this is the bus, right? And over here I have a cache block I. I have a cache block I. Let's say this is five. This is invalidated, right? And I issue a read from here. I want to read the cache block, right? Now what will happen? Cache block five C. Someone read to this. If I see someone read to this, I need to transition from modify to share. I need to make sure this data is updated here so that the share auto has the data that are updated. Then the person who read the data has to grab this data, put it here, five, and then I transition from invalidated to share. So this is basically how you can handle read or write issue. We do have an example from last year exam. I'm gonna pause this at the end of this class. So I used to do this as an example, but my recommendation is actually try to go through the question, right? So your subtask this week, 
go through the coherence question. And then when we come back next week, I will go through this question. I will, I will provide answer. If you actually went through it. So my homework today, go through that question. You will basically try and then when we are back, I'm going to go through the question together, right? We'll go through this together. So now we talk about the Snoopy protocol, right? So instead of a bus, we can use the central directory to keep track of copies of cache blocks, right? So the simple policy of doing this directory based protocol is this. For each cache block, and let's say there are four core, right? Let's say there are four core, you would store n plus one bit. So let's say you have four core, it's going to be five bits. Each bit would specify the status of each of the core's cache plus one bit. The one bit becomes the exclusive. If that one exclusive bit is on, it means that there's only one copy on one of the core. If you have a read, you set the bit. If you have the write, you invalidate the whole block and you reset all the bits. You then reset that, hey, someone else has the most updated version of the data and where's that? In this way, the cache can update silently if the exclusive bit is set. All right, so this is how cache coherence work. The next thing we have to go through is memory consistency. Now we have coherency between each of the private cache. The next thing is I need to ensure data consistency. How do I ensure data consistency? So when I run multiple application, they can share data. It means that they can update read and write in certain way. And this is specified by the ISA, right? This allow you to see the expected order of operation. You will see the expected order of operation. So on a single processor, this is simple. You can use one Neumann, right? So what we learned so far with out of order processor and in order processor, if it's a single processor, one Neumann, line by line by line by line by line, the order dictates by the line of code that you see. In the data flow model, the, the dependency would determine the ordering on what should happen before what. But this problem gets more complicated in the multi-core scenario because you can have multiple threads and they can update the data concurrently, right? In most cases, we in this context, we will assume that the programmer did the correct thing and lock your shared data correctly. Let's say we lock things correctly. Synchronization constructs such as locks, semaphore, and conditional variables will be used to protect the critical section. The hardware now is the task of the hardware. I see locks, I see semaphore, I see conditional variable. I want to make the program fast still, right? So I should be able to provide still the correct execution based on this lock semaphore and conditional variable including atomic operation and making sure the hardware see what the programmer tell you to do assuming that you know what you're doing as a programmer right and the concept here is called sequential consistency and the 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 back in the day sequential consistency is kind of defined and and uh formulated by the work by Leslie Lamport uh, on the paper, how to make microprocessor computer that correctly execute multiprocess program. What does it mean? It means that a multiprocessor or multi-core processor is sequentially consistent, which is a good thing. We want them to be sequentially consistent. If the result of any execution is the same as if the operation of all the processors were executed in some sequential order. 
highlight on all processor and highlight on operation. I have operation. All the processor have to do the operation in the same sequential order. And the operation of each individual processor would appear in this sequence in the order specified by the program. The second bullet point, the highlight is order specified by the program. We have to follow what the programmer tells you to do as a hardware design. We need to make sure we don't modify what the programmer tells you to do because otherwise things are incorrect. This is called memory ordering model. This is specified by the ISA, right? So for example, let's say there are four operations, A, B, C, and D. When you run the program, let's assume there's no lock or whatsoever, right? Any permutation of this can be the correct global ordering. When you run it the first time, you might see A, then B, then C, then D. You run it the second time, you might see B, then C, then D, and then A. You run it again, you might see A, and then D, and then B, and then C. This is a, these are all okay, as long as it follow what the programmer tells you to do, right? But the actual order would depending on the de implementation and dynamic latency, right? If C arrives first in DRAM and you don't have locks whatsoever, it can go first and the process first. The issue is this. The issue is this. If processor one, C, A, B, C, and then D, processor two and everyone else has to also see the same sequence, A and then B and then C and then D. If processor one, C, D, and then A and then B, and then C, processor two and everyone else also need to see the same sequence, right? This is sequential consistency. Everyone need to observe. Everyone that are running need to observe the same sequence. Otherwise, the hardware is wrong. Otherwise, the hardware is wrong. What are the benefits? Again, now you ensure every single processor would see the same global ordering within the same execution. There's not going to be the correctness issue due to the processor see a different data. The processor will not see the different data unless it's a bug in your software. However, multiple execution of the program can see the different global ordering, right? And this still can be difficult to debug. So if you run multi-thread application, especially let's say you use p-thread to do this, Right. You can run into bugs where we call this a rest condition, right? Something finished first unintendedly. So you have rest condition. This can be the software bug, but the hardware ensure that if there's a software, if there's a software bug, we don't fix it because we, we, we haven't been told by the programmer to fix the bug, right? We will do based on what the programmer tells you to do. Still, Sequential, sequential consistency, it means there's no hardware bug. What's the downside? This is too strong. Global ordering is a strong guarantee because we might not always want or need global ordering. For example, right? let's say A and B and D and C are the pattern that you are supposed to see. And only the request D is the right to the data, right? What you need to make sure is anything that happened after this write for the processor, right? If I see B, then an A, and then D, and then C, that's okay because by the time someone modify the data and, and someone else want to look up the data, which is request C, right? It's gonna strongly guarantee that D would happen before C. D would happen before C. I don't care about B and A. I only care that B and A would happen before D. So that's a happen before relationship. In this case, things that are supposed to happen before D, which I when I modify the data, should happen before. Things that should happen after, everyone else has to observe the same thing. It should happen after. This allow you to relax the consistency model, right? 
For example, in this case, you can have the global ordering across all the stores, right? So you have a total store order memory model instead of total global ordering. What if you can enforce ordering by assigning boundary of synchronization? This can be done by say the program can enter and exit critical section, and this would relax the consistency model. And this actually is used in OpenMP if I'm if I'm not wrong. They have the notion of this is the critical section, so you can have the global ordering. And then the rest, you have the relaxed consistency model. So what do I mean by weak consistency model? Weak consistency model is means that ordering is important when the operation affects the shared data. When the operation affects the shared data. So the idea behind the weak consistency model is, I'm going to have the programmer specify the non-shared data. Parts that are not shared, can be marked by different memory fence. So when you have the memory fence, right? So this is the fence. And this is the fence. Things that happen here has to happen before the first fence. And you have to ensure that is true. And then the fence complete, then followed by things here. Complete followed by things here. Within the region between the fence, things can happen in any order. But across the fence, you need to have to ensure the ordering. So this relax the requirement that every single access to your data have to have global ordering. The relaxation is now you just need to measure things that happen across the fence Things that are supposed to happen before need to happen before. Things that are supposed to happen after have to happen after. The downside of this is more work for a program because you need to identify where the fence should be. But my spin on this is this is a tool for a programmer to make your program faster. You can use the memory fence to accelerate your program and relax the consistency model right, to make sure it is correct. Now that uh, this is basically it for the lecture part of the today's lecture, we actually have quite a lot of time left. So I'm, I'm proposing this. I'm going to pause the midterm, um, not, not the midterm, the final exam on the canvas. I will give you maybe half an hour to look through the question and we will be back after 30 minutes and we will go through this question together. Is that okay? I guess. Yeah, so I think this might be perfect because we have a lot of time already and it, it I think it allow you to first absorb what the question is before I directly tell you the answer, right? And how to work through it. Uh, so let me go there and pause the file right now. Load. Uh, give me a minute. Okay, it should be up. It should be the name should be F20 Com Arc Final 2020 in the file. Uh, let me see. It should be in upload media, I think. Nope. Where is this? Ah, here. a typo in the name as I, why I cannot find it. All right, let me know if you can find this file or if you cannot. It should be up uh, in the file. You click on the file, that should be the file called F20 com RTGS final. Oh, uh, yes, yes, I got it. Okay, awesome. So your task for now is take a look at question number five. Take a look at question number five and try to go through the question on your own for the first half an hour. We will come back and we will go through this question together. Is that okay? Yes. All right, awesome. So I'm going to stop the recording because it's going to be a long 30 minutes uh, of nothing um, here. And when we are